psychobiology. And he studies methods for measuring uh, our response to poetry, painting, music, and humor quantitatively uh, in psychology. And uh, he is the guy I've been looking for all these years. And he's sitting right here on our own doorstep. He has another book called Conflict, Arousal, and Curiosity. And he's, he's a Gestalt man all the way. He studies structures, patterns, all the way. And uh, the general crowd around him conceal him from the view, of course, his own feet. The very name psychologist is enough to conceal it. <laughs> Uh, who's uh, who's benefit is this, uh, this uh, mic by the way? That's not meant any more than the... Which the James Joyce, who's the author? <laughs> Have you seen that yet? No, I don't know. Oh. Jack Hummel, this is the book that you're talking about, in, uh, oh, yes. that was written in uh, Trieste. Oh, yes. And um, I wonder whether you've seen a copy. No, I haven't seen it. Writing, yeah, writing text. By the way, who's this? Who's who's running this machine? You are, sister. Mm -hmm. But um, this is a. We'd had a chap here telling us about the efforts of the Italians to translate James Joyce Finnegan's Wake into Italian. I gathered that it was almost completed at the time that he was uh, yeah. talking to us. James Joyce uh, Finnegan's Wake is an account of the impact of uh, man's technologies on man, his own psyche. And uh, there's very few people know, really, that that's what the theme of the book is. I think we've got far too much brightness here. We're going to turn on this light, get rid of those horrible lights over here right now. There we are. And um, we can pull that one up there. Uh, well, Marshall, what do you say that if we pick 61 up for the table back? Well, if now. they turn up, but they may not make it tonight. They may not find us. I'm sort of hoping they won't. <laughs> they they came last year. They were here. They were here last year. Oh, it was a great, uh, yeah, a great gang. It's a kind of uh, touring group of university students. They they make several universities. <clears throat> but anyway, Berlin is very exciting stuff as far as I'm concerned. And by the way, he uses the semantic differential. Osgood. There is a method for measuring meaning and measuring human response to paintings, poetry, humor, anything, by verbal means. No labs, no audience samples. Anybody will do, as well as the next person. You know the Osgood semantic differential. I'm afraid not, Marshall. It's completely out of my Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to report it all to you. And <laughs> it's uh, strictly... Non-lab, they've, they've gone right past objectivity into subjectivity. The psychology that Berline plays with is, uh, is entirely subjective, like the new journalism. Who's talking about this? This is a psychological stress evaluator where you can tell by voice if you're lying. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a third dimension of the resonance. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the best cousin, or the sound of your voice, will do it for you. Well, this, <coughs> this is interesting because there's a book called And There Was Light by Jacques Doucyron in which he explains that when he lost his sight, uh, his uh, ears uh, to per perked up a good deal and he could tell exactly what uh, was going on in the mind of anybody who spoke to him. Uh, hidden behind the voice, he could tell the whole motivation, the whole... He was a very important man in the resistance in France because he could tell spies instantly. He could read their voices like open books. And uh, so this is a, a, the this, this sort of thing they're talking about right here. Recently, a third frequency modulation was discovered, indistinguishable to the, uh, to the native, naked ear, caused by mu muscle tremors was always present in normal speech. But in times of stress, as when you're lying, this frequency modulation disappears from the human voice, and the PSE chart shows when it's necessary. <coughs> But the blind person can pick this up quite easily, too. But uh, I thought I'd just mention the fact that the old uh, laboratory uh, so-called objective testing is out. The new subjectivity has come in, and it's, ver it's verbal in form. They simply test you by your verbal responses. They'll put two objects in front of you and say, now, which do you like the most? 
you like it very much more, which is ugly. Is this fast? Or you let Mike on the table. You say, you just say to the people, is that fast? Now people don't know what you mean. They put down the answer anyway. They don't explain any other questions. Put down the answer anyway. And they discover to their amazement that people know a great many things that they don't know they know. They pop all this into a computer, by the way. It's not done by ordinary processing. But the, they use seven preferences, seven, uh, seven forms of preference and, and uh, evaluation, all verbal, and no lab stuff and no audience samples. It's like the expanded Likert scale. The five value is expanded to seven value. That's all. It's the one that you can tell differences. They group themselves better this way. But the, I think what uh, is perhaps most interesting about this is the way of discovering the hidden ground of assumption. Well, so here you see this, this picking up a person who's lying is <coughs> hidden ground. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but um, Gestalt psychology began in 1915, Berlin reports. Uh, the first person to use <coughs> the word was a Danish chap in a treatise in 1915. Pick your ground as Gestalt approach to situations, that lamp is figure on table is ground. The two change each other. They do something to each other. If you put the table is figure on the rug is ground, the rug is figure on room is ground, and so on, and they keep banging against each other all the time. That is Gestalt psychology. It's figure ground psychology. And it's a dynamic psychology, and it's based on structures. No point of view, uh, no, no point of view exists in the Gestalt psychology. What we had uh, been working on earlier this year, uh, we hope to continue with right now, and that is power. We've learned quite a lot about it in Gestalt. There's a book by Rollo May, which he sent me a few weeks ago, called Power and Innocence. A search for the sources of violence. And um, it's... Um, very simple, basic, and um, I'll just read you uh, one passage, I think page 48 or is that 42? Uh, it's uh, power is simply the quest for identity. The fourth, fourth phase is aggression when self-assertion is blocked over a period of time, as it was for the Jews for many years and as it is for every minority people stronger form of reaction tends to develop. I spent three years in Salonika. I found that the 100,000 Sephardic Jews living there, one-third of the population of the city actually made up for the cultured intelligentsia of the city. There was a complete a absence of anti-Semitic prejudice such as existed in the rest of Europe and America. There was also a complete absence of the aggressiveness associated in this country with Jews. Indeed, the motto in Salonika was, it takes two Jews to outwit a Greek and two Greeks to outwit an American. An Armenian, sorry. <laughs> the Armenian, the group, the group at the bottom of the totem pole, were the ones in whom aggression and sharp bargaining had developed. Now, he relates this aggression and this violence to deprivation and uh, minority status. So... When aggression tendencies are completely denied to the individual over a period of time, they take their toll in a zombie-like deadening of consciousness, neurosis, psychosis, or violence. That it is a kind of frustration and suppression. Did we also, since we saw you have the, uh, our encounter with Dr. Hubbard and his group, Dr. Hubbard, had we talked about them? Do Dr. Hubbard. Hijack man. Hi hijack man. Oh. Oh. We talked about that in this. I see. Good. Last. Well, then let's switch to another area of uh, structures and uh, power. And uh, at the, uh, we it's have an interesting a article here in the <coughs> Globe and Mail on the uh, January the 13th, if any of you noticed it on. Is bureaucracy stifling urban progress? Mm -hmm. Well, doesn't tell you already <coughs> what this chap is driving at is that what's his name again Barry? Litwick. Litwick? Uh, any Litwick. 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 Carlton University Litwick. professor of political science. Uh, then uh, resigned. He was with the Ministry of Urban Affairs in 71. Changed, uh, 
His charging the government's approach was too limiting. He teaches economics at Carleton University, following our extracts from an article in the current issue of Canadian Public Administration. And what he's pointing out is how the government works. And this is uh, highly visible and is a good illustration of how all uh, bureaucracies work, whether in government, education, or, or business, large business especially. And he says that it is true that governments do come up with new programs, as in the fields of manpower, policy, education, medical care, etc., but these are mostly attempts to achieve old norms more efficiently, that is, to work faster with the old jalopy and the old goal. Now, in areas of real innovation, the attempts have been ill-considered and are rarely subjected to an ongoing process of improvement through controlled experimentation. That is, there's very little innovation that goes on in any large institution of any kind. The institution inhibits it. Now, John Kenneth Galbraith, he goes on, these are, I'm just reading some excerpts from has shown how naive the conventional view of business is, namely that it produces what the public desires. On the contrary, he finds that business devotes substantial resources to altering preferences by persuading the public to buy things business chooses to produce despite the fact that the goods and services are not initially wanted, not particularly useful, and often not very safe. Now, this is Galbraith's thesis of how it works in large institutions. Now, he, the district goes ahead... By the way, when they say the word business, you see, it's a, it's, not, it's a nonsense syllable, because if you look at any business, to find out who runs that business, and how do they make decisions about anything, well, then it's a completely different situation. The word business does not tell you anything, whatever. Exactly, because the hidden it doesn't tell you anything about the hidden environment. And the hidden environment in all of this bureaucracy are the assumptions of the literary world in which we are brought up, our Western civilization. Well, go ahead, let's have some more right, of this. Some he more. has some pretty good he themes. Says, uh, consider, for example, the uh, short takeoff and landing program. What urbanite really wants short takeoff and, and land aircraft operations from the heart of a city? That's the Similarly, for the vast array of useless military hardware, well, we don't need to go into the highways, social welfare programs, and so on. That is not to say that we don't require policies for defense for transportation for the poor, but what we get bears little resemblance to what the public wants and what its priorities are. Rather, it reflects the growing power of government to impose its will on society, a development that we must carefully, must be carefully examined. You notice how he judges. He isn't a process man, but he points out. He well, makes an inventory that's very well, easy. He sets up a great big conflict between bureaucracy and politics. Yeah. <laughs> big business can guarantee its survival by eliminating competition, and it does this through merger or through outright purchase. Governments have no real competition, particularly because among themselves they are generally agreed to abide by the status quo. Now we go on. Sole access to information essential to sound decision making, the growing irrelevance of all MPs outside the cabinet. None of that now. That's, that's the structure. Yeah. Growing irrelevance of all MPs outside cabinet. Why? The no, ac no access to information. Yeah. The marketing of political images rather than ideas for the same firms of The cabinet members have access to information that the MPs don't have. Yeah. And so there's, uh, there's a complete gap between the, the civil service and the politicians. <coughs> but just note, the public attitude to governmental failure at the bureaucratic level is one of cynicism. The, bureauc the bureaucrats are assumed to be shiftless, incompetent, hostile, remote, and reactionary. Much of this is not true, but the failure remains and so we must try to understand it. So it goes on. The bureaucracy is oriented towards specific historical norms. That is, things which are always based on the past. In an early area, these norms are easily identified and separated because society itself <coughs> was separable. A one-dimensional administrative structure yeah, let's get that. could give a reasonable assurance that it would not influence or be influenced by other norms. That is, as a man on the what, topic, Where does he come to the point about inside an actual bureaucracy, everybody works to push well, up okay. 
the oh, existing good. structure. All right. There is no reason to expect the bureaucracy to transform itself from a vertical to a horizontal or multiform norm focus. That is, there's no reason to think that the bureaucracy is going to change the rules whereby it can elevate its own status. Yeah. But what's no what's senior bureaucrat will willingly relinquish power and particularly the power to set priorities. His strength derives from the size of his bureau. There you are. And its size is based on the effective pursuit of the department's norms. Now, this uh, you're, you're getting into some awful verbiage there, Barry. I know, there there, there are some passages that I marked, I guess not in that passage. Well, no, no, there's not. You, you don't have my copy. No. Look, the, the ordinary bureaucrat, in order to enlarge his own bureau, say he wants to add a foot to his space, he has to push the boys on top of him up 10 feet in order to get one foot more for himself. Well, this is the exponential problem in bureaucracy. In order to get way, your way down in the lower echelons, you want a little more for yourself. You have to elevate the boys above you, change their lives, their salaries, their operation, ten times bigger, so you can be a little wee bit bigger. It's like single-handedly trying to lift the pyramid, eh? Yeah. Now, this, this, is, this is the weird circumstance. But yes, it isn't said in here. That's what it's implied, and this is the thing that we were discussing. It says it somewhere. I have no, no, no. It's not, not actually said. What is actually said is simply this: it's, uh, that the whole structure is, and we. It isn't remember, said at, it. remember, the at, at, in a bureaucracy, it is not the boys at the top who run it; it's the men underneath who run it. The men underneath who always run the bureaucracy. And the top, not, the top boys don't run anything. And it's not the politicians who have the information. That's what comes out of here. The, even though the cabinet makes the politicians <coughs> relevant, it's the civil service that provides the information to the cabinet, yeah. and this is a monopoly of knowledge which they maintain in such a way as to enhance their position within the bureaucracy. Now, this is their... But in order to enlarge, in order to have one more secretary way down on the scale, you have to push the man <coughs> above you way up into a much heavier, give him five secretaries so you can have one more. In order to increase your salary, you have to find another level in between you and the boys below, is another way of putting it. That is, if you're at a decision-making level at the top and you want to show how important your job is to the government, you have two ways of doing it. One, by maintaining that monopoly of knowledge, and two, by creating another layer, layer below you. Below you of what? Made of what? A, bureaucrat, a, a bureaucratic level. That is another but, level in organization. But is it of information or non-information? just another level of organization in the organization chart. That's what they mean by one-dimensional management. You create another title, which creates another level throughout the civil service hierarchy. You find within the, uh, the, the organization system another name. That by the way, the boys up higher are useless because they're not in touch with the information levels. No. Now, listen, yes. keep that in mind, that the higher of civil service don't have access to the information. It's the middle management area. Well, it's really the man on the job who is confronting the public that has the information, and the man on the top has information as to how to operate with a politician and how to operate with other bureaucrats in a role where he doesn't lose his own position but gains on every move. The more so the information he, he gets, has now, this the is authority. exactly what happens in a large organization. The more the information the civil service, the senior civil servants have the authority to deal with the government, which other right. civil servants don't. That's right. But not the information. But the information <coughs> comes from below. Now, the same thing applies, and this is really just quite visible in the government bureaucracy, and it's always used as a whipping boy for something else which is the whole assumption of our Western world that the man at the top knows what he's doing. And the man at the top and the bottom don't. And the man at the top deserves his big salary and his big office and his, his big staff. And his big staff is used to enhance his position. He not only deserves it, but uses it to enhance his position. So you have this syndrome of... But in actuality, mm -hmm. it, it is not this way. In actuality, this isn't the way the system is kept alive. It's kept alive. This is the appearance of the system, but this is not what it actually does, because the men who do the work are not the men at the top when it comes to dealing with the problems. The men at the bottom. Yeah. Do these same rules apply to the nanny bureaucracy? Or is that, um, nanny? The nanny bureaucracy, or is that a No, that's a passe now, but uh, that's another 
situation that uh, we might well have something to say about in a few minutes. There's another book, Saving the Appearances, I'd like to be reminded to mention to you. It's a little paperback that you ought to latch on to uh, by uh, Owen Barfield, but we'll come back to it too. Let's d d dispose of this one then, Barry. <coughs> okay, well, the final statement here perhaps disposes of it. There are two statements. The growing scale and complexity of the decisions have made it easy to exclude the public from these or those decisions. The bureaucracy keeps the necessary information confidential. All right, now take what's happening at this moment of Vietnam and Hanoi and, and so on, and the government and the bureaucracy and the State Department and so on. Where do you think the information really is? It's all processed. It's all uh, interpreted. And remember oh, that one of the big <coughs> factors in their information problem is public response now. Mm -hmm. Public response it becomes one of the big factors in uh, the situation that they're working in. I think the next in public response uh, to him power there is the ability or the effect of going completely against public response. I feel that he's, he sees this as a sign of power. Oh, yeah, well, if 99% of the people are against <coughs> something and he does it, this is a manifestation of power. You know, on the other hand, remember he's surrounded by people who are very dependent upon that well, goodwill of that very public. This same article, before we drop it, mentions, consider highway engineers, so this is the last column there, uh, who have roughly the same attitude to transportation as their colleagues in the auto firms the factories and highway construction companies. That is, the government engineers and planners share the exactly the same outlook as the same assumptions and the same patterns of information and decision making as the business world. <coughs> the same hidden assumptions, the same hidden environment. They lower the private cost of driving, induce greater demand for highways, and hence their own services. The same ability of public bureaucracies to use their tech technological interdependence with other bureaucracies in business to support their expansionist objectives can be seen in airport construction, in housing programs, in research funding, funding, in defense spending, where the leverage comes from the enemy's bureaucracy. In other words, you depend upon the enemy's information and policies in order to augment your own. There is basically, therefore, no conflict of interest between uh, us and the enemies, whoever the enemies happen to be. They're our buddies. Indeed, the fact that powerful interest groups can afford to replicate that information has led to even greater distortions, for they are the only ones capable of attacking seriously any proposal and forcing changes. This has been seen in revisions to the White Paper on Taxation pressed by the business community. The yeah. amendment to Competition Act, and more recently, the Gray Report on Foreign Ownership. On such, under such circumstances, it is hardly surprising that our political system is failing us. It has been unable to cope with modern problems of regional development, industrial policy, social policy, urban affairs. It cannot cope with the changing needs imposed by rapidly evolving values, accelerating technological advance. It is tied to the past by the dead weight of a growing conservative bureaucratic system. The conservatism is not in people, not in business, it's in bureaucracy, he said. For they have a huge stake in conservatism. But you see, with all of this, we always know that in every large organization, including the government, there are counter trends going on. And these are going on in several different ways. One is the counter bureaucracy, which is set for on the, the very top people, and the other is the little groups that start quietly, without disturbing the bureaucratic uh, garbage heap, doing things which they know are necessary, and getting away with doing fresh things, new things. Give us an example, sir. That you generalize. He finally came down to earth here with highways and, uh, and transportation. The same thing is wrong, our demand by Mr. Uh, these problems are not new, but our uh, 
calls for solutions have been and will continue to be largely fruitless. Um, now, he is not giving any examples either at that moment. Um, in the, no area is this more apparent than in urban affairs. Houses are built, but they are of the wrong kind, in the wrong location, for the wrong people. Welfare is provided, but it is continuing rather than liberating philosophy. Transportation is subsidized, but it's of the type that strangles the core of the city, drains the resource of the community. Planning is provided, but it offers security for the rich and guarantees insecurity for the poor. And, of course, these categories are very, very shifting, too. But uh, there, he's looking... Now, these are figure ground. Uh, it's a uh, <coughs> help. These are figure ground gestalt approaches in which, no matter what situation you look at, you say, okay, that's the figure. We're talking about, say, politics. Mayor Crombie is a figure. What's his ground? What is the ground in which Crombie operates? Is it the public opinion, or is it his buddies, or is it the opposition? Where is the ground against which his figure dings back and forth like the uh, clapper on a bell? Um, you have to discover where the ground is to know what's going on, because the figure does not determine the pattern. The ground is the pattern. The mm -hmm. figure is only an incidental side, uh, side bit. And one of the most powerful grounds surrounding all of these figures is what comes out here in the last column, Marshall. For bureaucrats have similar technological biases. It doesn't matter whether they're in private industry or government. No. And they, they share all, <coughs> the, they have all the ignorance and share all the bias of ignorance, uh, and the meaning the subliminal. They have all the subliminal unawareness of the world they live in that anybody has. Let's put it this way. They're in any community, the ignorance of what's really going on in the world <coughs> is shared by friend and foe alike. Both parties are completely ignorant of the ground they live in. The only people who have any knowledge of ground are artists in any period, in any, in any time. In any country, in any culture, the only people who know what the ground is in which they are culturally operating are artists. That is, they may be artists in music, in painting, in poetry, in, in anything. But they, the, the reason is that they do not depend upon ideas. They depend upon their perceptions. <coughs> of the ground. No, of the world they live in. <coughs> now, this is where this book, Saving the Appearances, comes in. It's a book by Owen Barfield, and it's a little book, about 100 pages, put out by Harbinger Paperbacks. And it's a study of what did the world look like to a man in 2000 BC, the world we live in right here. What would it look like to him if he just used his eyes and senses to look at it? As a matter of fact, the subtitle of the book is A Study of Idolatry. Yeah, but that doesn't help, does no. it? The word idolatry is not what we mean by idolatry. And what he means by idolatry is taking any concept and pushing it to an absolute. This is what we are well, doing with our concept. In other words, any fixed position. Sure. Taking any figure and pushing it to an now absolute. Now he said the same world looked at by the man in the Middle Ages was not the same. The uh, trees and the uh, spaces around did not look the same in 1200 A.D. They did not look the same in 1500 A.D. that they did in 1200, and in 1800 or 1900 they looked completely different. That is, the world vision <coughs> the, to the senses of the people living in those periods, the world they actually saw was not the same as the one we see today. In other words, the perceptual life of man, the figure ground, <coughs> The ground changes all the time, and the perceptions uh, change with the ground. The figure may remain quite, quite fixed. Uh, for example, at the present moment, the motor car has not been drastically changed by the jet plane. What has changed? What would you say has changed? Uh, what has the jet plane changed? It hasn't changed the motor car. Concepts of time and space. Yeah, it's completely altered the whole feeling we have for the world outside us. And this hasn't affected the design of the motor car yet, but it has changed the meaning of the highway. 
and the manufacturing services for motor cars and the whole ground in which the motor car the motor car <coughs> is a figure in the ground of huge services which are changing the motor car doesn't change it's only the ground that changes now the ground is the medium when i say the medium is the message i mean the ground the huge ground of services around radio around motor car that is the medium you might bring in that word medium well that's it uh, i discovered recently the word medium was latin for public the, the, in, in Roman times, they did not have a word for public. They used the word medium. The medium was the public. On the other hand, there were not, uh, there, in our sense of the word, there was no public in the Middle Ages, no public in Roman times. Uh, there was no public before printing, really, in any part of the world. There is no public today in China. <coughs> There is no public in Russia. And in the, say, of the 13th century, an artist would be an expression of a complete tribe. Mm, no, he was an expression of a patron. You see, he depended uh, on a local feudal overlord or patron. Little tiny pocket in the culture. No, but what I meant is they'd all see it. Say you know, they, the artist they may or they may not, but to uh, what they saw was like uh, going to see the uh, Sheik of Arabi in some distant part of the world. The, uh, the exotic and remote and romantic was what they saw. What do you mean public worship? The public in the, uh, our sense of the word is a group of uh, available people to process data. A public is a data processing thing. Sharing, information. Sharing information and processing it. It didn't exist uh, before uh, for printing. Published. Did the Russians and the Chinese ever publish? I doubt it. I doubt it. I just don't know for sure. But the Romans, anyway, used the word medium for public, what we call public, but they didn't really have a public in our sense either. It takes an enormous amount of technology to create a public. And incidentally, at the present moment, publics are disappearing very rapidly. Uh, they're decentralizing into little pockets again. That's why Life Magazine collapsed. Mm -hmm. Life Magazine was born with a public. Now it's collapsed. All they got is a bunch of little tiny regional pockets. Life Magazine is dead. So is Look, Saturday Evening Post. They had huge publics. The publics are dead. Rock music is fading out of sight because the rock music or uh, public is gone. Instead, they're having umpteen publics forming for rock. There isn't any one kind of rock anymore. There's 20 pounds. And so the public is disappearing and, uh, in favor of little tiny cliques. And that's what you have said many times about the book being obsolete. It isn't that the book isn't being published, but there are 20 different kinds there, of books where there used to be. There are now public. literally hundreds and hundreds of reading publics. There is no reading <coughs> public whatever. There is no reading public, but there are hundreds of reading publics. There are 39,000 new titles up per annum in English in America alone, in North America. 39,000 new titles per annum, which represent reading publics of hundreds and hundreds of uh, groups, and very little overlap among any of those hundreds of publics. What's some of the books with very little reading in them? What's, what's the relationship between power and public? Well, that's a question that you could uh, work if, out. If you take away public, what happens to power? Well, again, as I say, you can work it out. Uh, in the, the case of America in Vietnam, they lost the war because they were fighting it as if there were a public in Vietnam. All they found were guerrillas. Now, so guerrillas don't constitute a public, and they don't constitute a state. And uh, the United States doesn't understand guerrillas because the United States still has a public and still has a kind of monolithic structure. So when it fights anybody, it fights monolithically. And they do not have any means of fighting guerrillas, that's all. Guerrillas do not constitute a state or a society or a public. They are or an ideology. <coughs> or an ideology. This is what's happening in Ireland. The whole unity of the state, the UK, is breaking up into little regions. By the way, I think that book on the uh, 
idolatry, the study of idolatry, the um, Barfield? Stoving, uh, saving the appearances, it made the very big point that every time we study history, we rewrite it in terms of our present. Oh, yeah. That is, our present ideology, our present hang-ups, our present everything. And yes, this is where precisely why we can't understand the man of 2,000 years ago and why we have no understanding of these processes which are now returning. We don't try to see the world that he saw. We merely see him. Yeah. We yeah. never look at his ground. We just look at the figure. You see, when you look at Plato, you do not see Plato at all because you don't see his ground that he worked in. I hate to ask you to be redundant, Marshall, but, but could you give me the definition that you gave just a moment ago for public, the second time? Oh, a public is a data processing group, a vast uh, computer. Sharing interest. Oh, shared interest, yes. The, the public is a vast computer for data processing. I think it's a good what happens if you're not a shared interest? Huh? <coughs> if? You're not a shared interest. Not a shared. Yeah, if one is part of a public, but it's not a shared interest. Well, how do you, what do you, can you think of uh, how that might happen? Well, the public would reject the, 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 the uh, item that was non, not part of it. Before the public rejects it, there have to be uh, many, many loners and mavericks and alienated people who reject. Right. You see, that's what happens first. The public never gets around to rejecting anything. It's the people who make it up gradually break away from the group. Right. And they become guerrillas. Loners and mavericks and the dropouts are really not public, but uh, dropouts. Right. And so they are guerrillas. And communication, I think you said the other day, is communication, I'm sorry, is transformation or change that is shared. Well, the public uh, can be dependent upon. So the public, let's put it another way, Herb, is a homeostatic mechanism. Right. Um, what, I was, what I was wondering, Marshall, is that by your definition, if I understand you correctly, then under print conditions, the public would be ground? Yes, and it's created by print. Um, there uh, there was no public yeah. before print. Which, which brings up two questions, one of programming and the other of what happens when the flip occurs. I would say, for example, with Howard Hughes. Uh, could you fairly say that, that a man like Hughes, a power creates his own public but as figured? You see, the, uh, his case, he's a monster because the figure in the ground merged. Uh, his operation and what? himself became <coughs> the same. And when the figure ground merged, you have no figure ground and uh, you have a monster. This is like Orson Welles and the um, broadcast from Mars or the invasion from Mars. It's monster because the figure and ground merged. Well, I've been, I've been thinking, I've been rereading uh, Twitter and Taboo by Freud and also Frazier. And uh, I've been thinking of... Um, the analogy between Hughes and, say, a, a Tahitian yeah. chief yeah. with much mana, or yeah. much power. Yeah. And in those tribal conditions, a man with much power has an extraordinary number of taboos surrounding him. Yeah. And um, I, I can't think of a better example. Yeah, he's contemporary. He was, he was, he was, yes, Hughes is a wonderful example. But movie stars and, and various types of uh, public stars uh, who merge with their publics to uh, become similarly helpless. I think you know it wouldn't be a bad idea to have a bit of air. Mm -hmm. Just open one of those windows there. So I think it's got with this breakdown of public, what happens to uh, your concept of retribalization? Well, not the little tribes. Tri uh, tribes are not publics. That's true. Publics are made up of individuals, and tribes are not. There are no individuals in a tribe. There's no private individuals. There's no such thing as privacy in a tribe. There's only the merging with the totem figure. And uh, under electric conditions, we all tribalize because we live simultaneously with the same data. And it's as if we were all listening in on the same wavelength at the same moment at all times. And uh, this is as it is in Africa or in any small tribal group. They don't have a point of view on anything. They, they have a very strong tribal identity, and this is something that's corporate. Cool. They have no private identity. But you were talking about the breakdown of the public <coughs> into cells. Yeah. It doesn't seem to have access to the same kinds of information. Oh, now we're talking about the end of our public. This, the, the pub, what we call public is going. Uh, that's why life collapsed. There is no public for life anymore. But it was the advertisers who discovered this. The advertisers said, Life magazine cannot give us access to the public's, plural, 
that we want. We don't want to sell our product, our perfume, or our car to 40 million people, that's all. We only want to sell to 2 million people, 1 million. And life could only give them access simultaneously to, what, 8, 10 million? And the manufacturers suddenly discovered that their publics were quite small. And this is new. Uh, the, uh, the whole, the, our entire world is decentralizing very quickly. Our economy is decentralizing. Our <coughs> school system will have to decentralize very quickly. Our universities are decentralizing. They call it student, uh, uh, lack of student enthusiasm for going to school. No such thing. It's just that they found umpteen other forms of activity. So you can decentralize and yet re-tribalize at the same well, They time. are the same thing. Tribalizing, uh, tribalizing and decentralizing the same thing. Tribes are small because the human family unit that can only sustain a certain amount of size then it collapses. And you see that's what's happening within the bureaucracies everywhere. These little groups of groups or tribal groups are establish themselves as defense organizations within the enormous uh, conflict. Little cliques inside the big bureaucracy. Sure, certainly. So you done by word of mouth, <coughs> not done by the nothing memos. On nothing no on memos. paper. Nothing on paper. The local defense So this is called a palace revolution, say, in, in political terms. A palace revolution was done by word of mouth minus the bureaucracy. They just go past the bureaucracy. And it was all done by oral means. Uh, we're moving very rapidly under electronic conditions back into tribal and oral conditions of communication. Uh, and this doesn't have to be against the interests of anyone, but it's not. Well, it's, it's, it just simply uh, means the pulling the rug out from under the old uh, figure. That's all. That's all. The, the whole establishment as we've known it just is ignored. So when people ask you whether it's good or bad, that's an irrelevant question. The question is to see the effects of it. Is Howard Hughes' comment that he maybe thinks he'd like to emerge from his anonymity uh, in any way connected with the demise of life? <laughs> his, I mean, did his public disappear with life, disappearing from the public? I'm not able to say, but I should think that Howard Hughes' world disappeared <coughs> from under him long ago. He was just, he was like a man on a life raft or a hotel hermit. Uh, he, there is no public for Hughes. There is no world that he belongs to anymore. He, hi he has a hired public, which are his experts, that he surrounded them by. To, to yeah, and notice, so notice that public. this is the uh, meaning of the psychiatrist. Yeah. A hired public for people who can't get anybody to listen to him. Howard Hughes has a hired public <laughs> only. No, but it's a very convenient thing. The psychiatrist does <coughs> perform a real need, or, or answer a real need. He is a public that can be bought and will listen patiently and uh, intelligently to anybody. And to some extent, Marshall, this oh, sorry, is... Sorry, wait a moment. This is a, a show. No, you said, did you say they pulled, they pulled the ground out from under him in Nicaragua? Are you talking about <laughs> earthquake? <laughs> oh, the earthquake. <laughs> That's called an act of God. It's nothing to do with, nothing to do with PR. <laughs> it shook him loose. That's a very interesting phrase, act of God, meaning when you can't explain anything. <laughs> Blame it on him. Blame it on the deity. By the way, this is again another way of dealing with our civilization. You notice that they can't deal with change. We have no theory of transformation, whatever, in the Western world. This is the thing we keep coming back to. Yeah, I think Only this is worth change. keeping this in mind. That in the Only Western world, change. there is no philosopher, no economist, there no is psychologist who has any theory of change. There is no theory of qualitative transformation, whatever, in the Western world. Quantitative, yes. Yeah, say quantitative variation, yes. They will say we're running short of fuel on this planet. Exactly. <clears throat> and therefore, we have an enormous crisis. And we must do something about it in the next 10 years. But at the, the same time, fuel. at the same time, we may be running <coughs> short of people who are interested in using that fuel. Exactly. But they don't, they can't explain this. Oh, no, that isn't, in, that isn't in the parameters of the equation they use. They can only think about how many people are going to burn how many gallons of gas in the next so many years, and we know how there are going to be so many more people, but they have never been able to figure out why should people suddenly decide they don't want big families. So precisely at the time when we live in a world of change, we in the Western world have no theory of change whatever, and we reduce all change to accident. And a calculation of whether or not the accident is well, likely to happen or not. 
Well, there, is, there is a reason, though, why we have no theory of change. You might as well know why. I mean, it's, it's not only that we have no theory of change, we have to explain. This itself is a factor that needs explanation. All other people in all other parts of the world in all human history always have theories of change. Why did the Western world have no theory of change? Every tribal society, every group of human beings in every part of the world always had a theory of change, and many theories of change. Why is the Western man alone in having no theory of change at all? What? Are you sure? Sure. Name it. Who I've has? Got, I've got two theories of change in my MA thesis. <laughs> yeah, but you are not no longer dealing with the Western world. We, Western world's already <laughs> already gone Oriental long ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, we, we're all living we're all living now in a new kind of culture, which is Oriental. It's not Western anymore. However, what tell us by all means what one of your theories of change is? Well, the t I have two titles. One is called Organization Disorganization Protest yeah. and Change. Yeah. The Saskatchewan Medicare Crisis. Yeah. The other is called Sources of Change and Resistance to Change in Saskatchewan since 1944. Good, good. On the other hand, you're dealing, uh, you're, you're taking for granted a great big structure. And when you're talking about so change, you're talking about change inside that structure. Land, a, a land boundary. <coughs> but the, the possibility that people might just ignore the whole structure and leave it, just leave it sitting there and ignore it, go away from it. Well, they did. Well, this could happen anywhere. This but they were attracted by it, too, you see, yeah. because... Uh, but why did they suddenly decide to abandon it? Because the government changed. Uh-oh. Why did the government change? That, that's the first... That's, no, that's why did the, the government paper. change? Pardon? Why did <laughs> the government change? Because of those two papers. So that's what those two papers describe. Oh, but uh, just a moment, though. <laughs> you see, a change, you're still talking about ground. Oh, yeah. And, you see, uh, you're technology. assuming... Okay, you're technology. assuming. You're assuming <coughs> the ground is going to stay there. Uh, the change will take place in your terms in the figures. In the fall. Well, yeah, the figures. The ground itself, you assume, will continue. Yeah. Well, that's what the change takes place. The change never takes place in the figures. It always takes place in the ground. That's why I say today the jet plane is not changing the motor car. It's changing the highway. The, it's not the figure of the car, but the ground of the car that is wiped out by the jet. The jet just goes around the highway and leaves it sitting there useless. The jet plane will destroy the motor car totally, but not immediately. The motor car is dead, completely dead right now because of the jet. It okay. can still be used for getting to airports. Yeah, but uh, it's <coughs> like the, uh, when the horse, uh, the, first, the use of the horse when the motor car came in was for pulling motor cars out of ditches. <laughs> You see, they didn't have highways, and cars were always running off the old roads into the mud ditches. <laughs> the horses had never had it so good as when the car came in, because it was ten bucks to get your car out of a ditch, which is about every day of the week. And you, in order to pass another car, you had to go to the ditch. And if you ask anybody what a good future business was for the cabmen in the old days, they had a very simple answer. Pulling cars out of ditches. Any fool can see that. The horse never had it. <laughs> so good. That's when the motor car came in. <clears throat> but this is a question, again, the figure ground uh, was not understood. That's right. The airline companies have lots of uh, rent car have gone into rent car business. Each airline has its own rent car business. <laughs> <car. laughs> <laughs> 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 the auto But in the meantime, with the movies, the horses came back with a rush for westerns, <laughs> and there never were so many horses in North America as since the westerns. <laughs> now look what's happening to the bicycle. The bicycle will come Wiped back off to the, the highway by the car now. And look how Pretty the movies are now starring uh, automobile changes, one after another. Yeah. Well, you see, the, no, the, the horse, horse came back as an art form. The motor car will come back as an art form. That's nostalgic. The movies have come back as art form, not as entertainment. The TV is the entertainment, and the, the uh, archaeology is the movie. But the... Uh, Always, uh, the old form will always have a second <coughs> uh, return trip, or uh, return bout as an art form. With, with a different relationship, a different meaning, a different... The figure ground is completely changed. Well, we still don't hear the answer, do we? Why does the Western world not have to change? Why is it so Yeah. Dramatic? Well, again, it, Western man is the only man who <coughs> ever invented a visual structure of organization. And visual space is static, like Euclid. 
Uh, we invented this amazing thing. It's the only culture in the history of mankind that ever had a merely vi the Egyptians had no visual culture. Uh, they had entirely audile tactile forms. The chariots of the gods were not visual; they were audile tactile energy units. And uh, the uh, <coughs> Greeks and the Romans uh, relied on this visual form of space and organization, which is static. I always remember tell the story about the little boy in the airplane who said, Daddy, when do we start to get smaller? Now, there are very few people who can explain why a plane gets smaller in the sky, but it, inside it stays the same. Why does it get smaller outside and stay the same inside? There's another aspect of the notion of truth in Western culture and change at a conflict, mm -hmm. whereas in uh, non-Western culture, truth is change. Yeah. I mean, that's the problem in truth. Yes. It's so that's the way. Uh, change, any theory of change is magical. And so all uh, all non-visual cultures uh, have magical theories of change. You see you see this in the history of mathematics. The whole problem of transformation through differential calculus is still a hang-up as far as a mathematician is concerned. They go to extreme lengths in the theory of limits to sneak transformation in by the back door after going through infinite heaven. Look at well, that's like going through the vanishing point. <coughs> like, uh, allows one of them. Going through the looking glass and then dragging in change as a form of child entertainment. Exactly. The only way you can get The only way you can have change in the Western world is in the nursery with kids. Fantasy. But uh, the, there is no way of explaining how you can change visual space. This space that we're sitting in is visual because it is contained. Now, there is no part of the world that has a contained space like this except the West. It also loses much power, Marshall. Uh, Which one, the uh, visual? Uh, yes. Yeah. You know, because uh, with magic, of course, the, the, the power in magic is child's play, which is wish fulfillment, mm -hmm. which is um, mm -hmm. which is which is the first power that any individual uh, in its development uh, starts to have, which is um, what is it? Um, uh, omnipotent. Yeah, omnipotent thought. Uh, so, so the young child is very, very powerful by, uh, by, <coughs> by his older counterparts. It's quite uh, sure. intimate. Well, the visual space inside the plane cannot change because it is enclosed space. Outside the plane, <coughs> it is not enclosed and it does change. Outside The plane outside is not a visual space at all. It's an acoustic space, kinetic space, and it changes very fast. But inside that enclosure is fixed space. Is visual. Euclidean space is all static. And uh, whereas all the other spaces of touch and sound and movement and so on are all dynamic, visual space comes only from the alphabet. And there's a reason for this. The alphabet separates the meanings of words from their sight. Their appearance is completely abstracted from their meaning. The letters of the alphabet have no semantic meanings at all. Every other alphabet in the world has meanings for its letters. But the R letters have no meanings at all. Semantically, that is, as words. All the other alphabets in the world are semantic alphabets and syllabic alphabets with significant qualities and characters. <coughs> when you separate the sight of a letter entirely from all dynamic meaning. You get an abstraction that is very is unique in the history of mankind. And Euclid was born at that moment, the moment that visual space was abstracted from all the other spaces, you had Euclid instantly, and Plato was founded on Euclid. The Platonic archetypes, the Platonic ideas are all visual Euclidean, on static, unchangeable. The Greek world is an absolutely static world. There's no place for change in Aristotle or Plato. So why, of all the people, they could have bought time to be by Plato? Uh, well, just a moment, though. His ground was that alphabet. He took it seriously. He was figure in that ground. The, hit, the ground, by the way, is always hidden. It's never noticed by the people who use it. This is as true not as much now as it ever was in the history of man. If they hadn't had Plato, would they gone ahead and done that anyway? No. No, indeed not. 
Mm-hmm. What do you mean? Oh, no. No, no, just a moment. Uh, they could have done it if they had the alphabet. If they could have, they could have made another Plato. <coughs> yes. Aristotle made it as a pretty good re- repeat for Plato. It's somewhat a, a, ver- a variation on it. But, uh, but neither, neither Aristotle nor Plato have any theory of change. In fact, they deny the possibility of change. Now, the amazing thing is this. Christianity was founded on the Greco-Roman base of stasis, and Christianity is concerned only with change. It has no theory of stasis, whatever. Only change. Everything in Christianity is change, change, change. Everybody's going to be changed all the time. And how can a, a, an, on, an absolutely uh, flux-like changing church be founded on a Greco-Roman stasis? Well, at the present moment, the Greco-Roman stasis is disappearing just like smoke. Under electronic conditions, you cannot have Greco-Roman patterns. You cannot have Greco-Roman alphabet under electronic conditions. So that's how it didn't appear. Well, I wouldn't say that particular example is necessary, although it, it's, I, I should think, part of the story. But the sudden discovery on the part of the young that they are not interested in the alphabet and not interested in enclosed spaces in schools. Nobody has told them why they're not interested. They just suddenly don't find any more meaning in it. What they look, when they look, when a child, a TV child today, looks at a classroom, it sees nothing, just zero. There's nothing here that could interest him at all. It's, uh, in its extreme forms of meaning, it's a prison, but uh, that doesn't occur to very many. Mostly it's just nothing. And so they turn their backs on it quite naturally. Well, you're a philosopher, Jane. How do you explain yourself? Are you already well, all right. Let's uh, let's find out. Uh, the um, I came across people who were interested in change, people like Innes, uh, who uh, Harold Innes, <coughs> and uh, Gideon, and people like James Joyce and, and uh, Picasso. These people abandoned, deliberately, uh, turned their backs on the visual world in favor of the other senses. You see, Picasso is not a visual man. He goes into the other senses. By the way, Montessori is not visual. The Italian educator, she said, look, if you uh, want to measure (coughs) IQ in terms of visual competence, you're going to get an awful lot of stupid people around you because most people are not that visual. And... um, so she said, let's try to improve their intelligence by appealing to their other senses. The Montessori system is based on non-visual learning, manipulative and tactile and acoustic. And she discovered that uh, the so-called uh, backward or unintelligent child had just as many brains as any other child, except that it was not visually oriented, that's all. The Negro today has very little visual orientation, even in, in suburban America. He prefers kinetic, acoustic modes, and that's why he's great in sports and music. In fact, if you could test the IQ of uh, black American and white American mm-hmm. on their understanding of rhythm, mm-hmm. uh, if right. you test them by ear, they'd be... And color. You see, the, uh, the non-visual man has uh, <coughs> wonderful color sense, whereas the visual man, the uh, Euclidean man, is very, uh, very poor in colors very poor on most things, except visual measurement quantity. By the way, the visual man is a quantifier. He divides everything into little bits, uniform, exactly uniform bits. This is visual. Only the visual sense permits divisibility. You cannot divide acoustic space. You cannot divide the space of touch. It's, a, it's, not, a, it's, not, a, it's not a continuum at all. Here's the paradox. You can only divide that which is continuous and connected. You'd think that you could divide things that are discontinuous, like sight and sound, like sound and touch. No, you can't divide them at all. You can only divide that which is itself continuous and connected, and that is sight. The only sense we have that provides a continuum, the only sense we have for one, two, three, four, five, six, you cannot even have numbers without sight, without alphabet. 
Without A, B, C, there's no one, two, three. So even our arithmetic is based on the alphabet. It's very hard to explain to people these things because they think you're theorizing, and, uh, and if, if that's the case, then it's nonsense, of course. But what we're talking about is a change in perception. The alphabet brought about a new way of seeing the world. It didn't bring about any new theories. It just changed people's way of seeing. And when you have a new way of seeing, well, it's not hard to invent new, new, new geometry. You can invent new architecture, new anything, when you have a new way of seeing, or a new way of feeling, that is. Seeing is used. We use the word seeing for all the other senses of another one. It's ridiculous, isn't it? But we use the word seeing for all the senses. Well, then the continuous conveyor belt of mechanization that provides change your state. That yeah, the, that you see, by definition, the conveyor belt is more of the same, always. Repeat, repeat, repeat. It's the visual form. Repetition is always visual. It's based on matching. What we call representation, realism in art, and truth, it's always based on matching. And that comes in very well here when we talk about visuality and organization. It is right here. In most instances, the only solution that can be provided, the only solution that can be provided by our political system is more of the same thing, perhaps more efficiently. In other words, we're dealing always with more of the same, more efficiently, meaning faster. Get Driving the old jalopy faster. And cheaper. cheaper. Do the old thing a little faster, a little <coughs> cheaper, and you're, you're, oh, you've got, you've got it. Right. The whole of your... However, the kids are see, not interested in going to school, and they're not interested in living in cities, and they're not interested in vehicles. <coughs> I, a great many of the children in our TV world uh, just don't have that kind of interest anymore. They'd sooner live with animals or live in Africa. Do you know that the ordinary TV child would be very much more at home in the Eskimo world or in the African world than he is here in Toronto? Very much more at home. Feel more natural. Because the TV, that's the images here, the TV image changes the sensory set on the perceptual mode. It doesn't change any theory, it just changes the perceptual life of the young. So they see another, another world. Now, I don't, say that, I don't uh, think that I imagine this to be a good thing. I myself think that this <coughs> kind of change, occurring at the incredible speed that it is occurring at, <coughs> is about the same thing as an atom bomb. I think any kind of speed up of change is a blight and blitz and destruction. We're destroying ourselves at incredible speed. And we're talking about fuel shortages and population explosions instead of talking about what's happening. The fuel shortages and population excess is not what's happening. What is happening is that the people on this planet are changing totally and they're not the same people anymore. That's a nuclear explosion, Emma. No. No, no. Women's Lib, on the other hand, Mr. Schultz is very much interested in Women's Lib. Women's Lib represents the kind of blitz that is taking place in just changing completely the nature of men and women. Their, women their nature is being changed. Hmm? You say women on the ground and men on the or vice versa? <laughs> it, again, it differs from, I mean, you might say it, in Japan it's one way, in China another way. If you can have a flip in the same... Yeah. But women are usually in the service environment. Up to a point, because <laughs> in some societies, women are the rulers. That is, in most tribal societies. That's where it flips over to the disservice. No, but if, if the service people become sufficiently aware <coughs> and are sufficiently coherent among themselves, dialogue and so on, they eventually become the rulers of any society. And the women uh, are the rulers of all primitive societies for the very simple reason that the only people who are always around. Uh, the men are always away, food gathering or doing some special job. The men are specializing. The women specialize in everything. They stay home and they run the show. So in the mafia, the women do not. Uh, women run the mafia, not men, not Godfather. The mafia are run by women. In uh, Sicily, anyway. And in, uh, I, I venture to say that in uh, 
any travel society on this planet at this hour, the real bosses are women and have been for a long so time. So the hidden ground of the godfather is a godmother. <laughs> not, a, not even a godmother, just mother. Wow. Well, no, that's why the handler is being handled. So which is being? <coughs> the handler is being handled. The handler is being handled. The gorilla, who are the gorillas in the mafia? The ones without mother? <laughs> no, the gorillas are the are the boys who are sent out to do what the mom tells them to do. They're they're the thing is they're, they're they get their instructions not from their other trigger men. The contact. The bosses. Anyway, there was a special image that uh, attracted a great deal of attention. And uh, Mr. Carl painted it. And you might tell us just what you did in that setup. Well, because I think a lot of people here understand what's involved. It's, uh, I'll try and describe it as best I can. Uh, I painted a, a canvas about eight and a half feet wide and about ten and a half feet high. And the whole canvas is red. Two diving figures diving into the red, painted on within it, and spaced so that quite close to the center. Okay. So that you're not so aware of the edges of the painting as you are of the actual fact that it's colored. Yeah, that's one of the reasons for the size. So that you're, you won't read it as a painting or a, a canvas on a wall as an environment, and it was placed in locations where, at the end of a corridor, so that it became even more of an environment or a continuation of that corridor, and the red uh, became the environment not only through the paint, but through uh, lighting that, are, that had arranged about 20 feet in front of the painting, directional lighting onto the, the divers onto the red, uh, so that as a viewer, when you came up to the painting, you were involved in the same lighting, same directional lighting that the divers were receiving. And uh, by doing this, I hope, anyway, to involve the viewer in a painting, rather than just he being separate from it and seeing it on a wall, he just now was part of it. Space anyway could become or feel the same as one of the divers. Um, now the two figures, was, uh, the divers he mentions, are uh, as it were in an anti-gravitational space, which gives you a strong feeling of kinetic position, as if you were a scuba diver. Uh, suspended, floating in a submarine situation. Now, to see uh, two objects in visual space, you know, an ordinary, as it were, canvas, but actually not, the canvas, you see, suggests pictorial space, visual, connected space. The divers are not in visual space, but kinetic, tactile space. And you very seldom see this situation. Mostly you, you see one space. You see, uh, you can see uh, people swimming in wa underwater. Uh, but you don't ordinarily see them framed in a visual space. So there's an interplay between the two kinds of space which creates quite a special effect. And so, People are quite captured by this object, all these people uh, portrayed. Make you feel as if you're underwater swimming yourself. Just Except right there. that there is this additional factor. You're yeah. also in a, thick, a visual space. Yeah. Yeah. Visual space, remember, is continuous, connected, static. And this underwater space is not connected. 
not static. So you have the interplay between these spaces, which creates a very strange effect. This is, <coughs> this is achieved by putting the viewer into the red light. This is a big breakthrough there. You well, become part of it by being in that, bathed in that light. That, that's the only part of it, though. That's mm -hmm. It was an important part, and that's one of the uh, aspects that I, I tried very hard to achieve, <laughs> was the, the fact of involving the viewer so that he felt part of the environment he was looking at. Mm -hmm. Some of the lighting around in the corridor is red. So that he, although you're not aware of a great big red light shining on you, you can look at someone inside mm -hmm. you, you can see a red glow, which is part reflection in the canvas and part lighting. But, uh, it's interesting that you said uh, it's tactile and kinetic, kinetic space. And the, there's no frame, no frame for that picture. You're in it. I wanted uh, to the ambiguity of abstract and realism. Well, then, when you say abstract, of course, is the kinetic tactile. <coughs> and uh, because anything that, uh, if you pull out the visual, then you have abstract. But here you added visual to abstract. You superimposed the visual or vice versa. You could, you know, get some further effects with music, with an acoustic space around the whole thing. Mus music, you see, is like water, being underwater. You're not listening to something, you're simply bathed in it. The whoosh of the water, would be enough. I don't know. But, uh, well now, before uh, plunging in any other direction, uh, we might introduce a few people. I see some new people here tonight. Might introduce yourselves. Are you in the corner here? You are just Paul named. Lapos. Your name is? Paul Lapos. Laos? Lapos. 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 And uh, I know Miss Smith and Mr. Lamba and our old friend uh, Stuart and uh, the uh, Mr. Mon and uh, our anthropologist friend. How do you say your name again? Andre Salcedo. Salcedo. And beside you is Miss? Brisbane, Rich Brisbane. Mr. Brisbane. Yes. Are, you, are you a newcomer tonight? No. You were the one, you were the friend who had the <coughs> eye problem a year ago that you told us about, weren't you? Yeah. Weren't you? No. Oh, no, no, that was somebody. Doug somebody. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there, I now. We, had a, we had a man who came in here a few about a year ago, who just had an eye operation. He just recovered his sight a few hours earlier, after many years of blindness. And he wanted us to know about the experience of recovering or learning how to see again. I had, uh, there was a man here a few, uh, this afternoon who had been blindfolded for three days. And when they said, when they took off the blindfold, they had to see, uh, learn to see again. For about uh, an hour afterwards, the eyes did not function stereoscopically and so on. They had to Learn once more how to focus on objects. When you, at first, when you re recover sight, objects are by themselves floating. You don't focus on them at all. But um, le yeah, learning to see is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, a naturally, for most people, something that uh, takes place over a period of months or years. So they're completely unaware of it. But for people who have suddenly recovered sight, uh, seeing is a learned art. Now, we have a lot of other people here tonight that I haven't seen before. Uh, this man we've seen before. Let's say your name out loud. Ralph, Ralph Kelman. Kelman, the our lighting man. Mm -hmm. The man who's been studying the illumination of cities. Last week, when I was not here, we had a man who was studying illumination of inner space from OCA. Dr. Thayer. Oh, Mr. Thayer. He's not here tonight. No. And, uh, we have uh, a new visitor tonight. Peter Gallup. And your uh, world is, or thing is? an iconic uh, graphics. Which Commercial involves you in, in what kind of work? Billboards. And I see. Neon right. sculptures, neon signs. Are they now officially uh, recognized as iconic? Well, I hope so. Uh, working on it. Iconic graphics. Uh, Involving, again, the sense of touch, pattern recognition by outline, bounding lines, a phrase uh, much used by William Blake, the engraver. He stressed, 
in his fearful symmetry and so on, his images that he presented in his poetry and his work was, he stressed bounding line, which is tactile. And this is what children draw when they draw any kind of thing. What they stress is uh, what, they, what they know, touch. So they draw everything by bounding lines. Have you been working with inter-systems on this, the, the uh, mobile sculpture? No, I don't know. Well, we have, well, I think we, we better get around to a few other people who are, uh, what about our, my man on the left here? Peter Burnell. <coughs> Peter Burnell. And uh, your uh, world is? The world I'm working is a clock in the bank. Okay. The, uh, how would we describe that? Is that, uh, is that a submarine? Or sub, <laughs> sub rosa? <laughs> it's a, a kind of um, mysterious world anyway which reminds one about bank holdups and hijackings. Have you noticed that there have been no hijackings for months? Now this means merely that they have put a veto on all hijacking news. They're never going to be reported again. You know why? Hmm? And motivation. Without coverage, there's very little motive for hijacking. And uh, so they're hoping to reduce the incidence of hijacking this way. The man who's just come in is, has uh, the name of? Desmond, Robert Desmond. Robert Desmond? Have you been here before? Oh, yes, sir. I, well, I wasn't here, so. Do we, have we heard about your, we're just checking on what people do who are here tonight. What's your world? Uh, the movie. Oh. Well, that's. You're, you're the first uh, representative of that world. My name is uh, Brian Cosentino, and I'm presently teaching in the United States in Connecticut, teaching science and social studies, and I'm uh, doing graduate work in speech communication in Southern Connecticut. Um, and uh, Mr. Constantino mentions that uh, there's been a considerable drive in the States lately to get communication off the hardware world into the speech communication. Dr. Hall and I uh, were talking earlier this evening about another form of communication, namely BO, not negative, but positive. There's a watershed between negative BO and positive BO. Negative BO repels. Positive BO invites, is intercom. And uh, you might say a word or two about that gap between those two areas, uh, Ross. Well, a lot of us know about uh, communication amongst animals in terms of using odor the sexual attraction and, and uh, repulsion between different animals. But what we don't know is, is what happens in the case of humans. And, but there is quite a bit of um, <coughs> speculation that there's just as much communication at the human level as at the animal level in terms of, uh, in terms of odors. But uh, we tend to, in our society, tend to suppress all odors. And so this whole form of communication is suppressed. So the positive value of the what, what do you call the BO that is part of ordinary? Well, there are certain compounds that are secreted by glands uh, in the armpits, for example, and groin, which are, have very specific functions in terms of the odor, the odor, the odor producing compounds, which are quite separate from the odor caused by uh, decomposing sweat, which is what we call BO or body odor. <laughs> yeah, the BO that we speak of is usually stale, stale. perspiration. Yeah. Whereas the positive BO is never referred to and uh, is uh, presumably mostly below the subliminal. We're only conscious of the stale BO. Now, this is a, a big area of intercom that uh, about which very little is known. It is being studied, strangely enough, as most things are of this kind, for animals and for insects. You see, uh, the latest uh, way of killing insects is by a sex attractant that kills flies. Now, uh, uh, you you just kill them literally by sex. You're killing. It's an overdose. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very effective, and there's no uh, pollutant. Not so much the sex attraction does the killing, it's the fact that there's instead of a uh, white <coughs> female who went in, there's a white female shark. That's the principal thing. Now, who How else? We can't.
kill people with Chanel number no. five. Sorry. <laughs> Grind them up and extract their, their sex attraction. Also, you gotta catch the female. That's right, yes. Mm -hmm. No, we have any other visitors here tonight? Um, yes, sir. Peter McCarney, uh, works for a publishing company. And uh, Alan Jones is stockbroker. Oh, that's quite a spectrum of interest. And over there? And Tony has a flight transportation engineer. I was up until about two months ago doing research with MIT with the effect of aircraft noise on community. What happened? What did you discover? Well, I was trying to devise some formula that would suitably quantify the effect of community reaction to the presence of aircraft flying overhead or landing at nearby airports. And in such a way, one hoped to be able to, uh, to minimize this, this uh, total community reaction by changing aircraft flight paths, by making aircraft quieter, by making them fly higher, whatever the case may be. But unless one can somehow quantify the reaction, one doesn't know whether changing any flight pattern actually makes things better or worse. What kind of... You're looking for a sort of nuisance factor. That's right. You know. What and kind of... I was wondering what kind of measurements that you were able to take. Well, I, I didn't actually take any measurements myself, but I was essentially um, working upon the experimental studies of other people to try and produce a, a, some equation which was <coughs> both manageable and hopefully understandable to the public at the same time. It's eventually Ultimately, one has to get this across to the public. Had you come across the Osgood semantic differential scale? No. I think you might look into that because it's very handy and very manageable. It's verbal. But uh, using two th two situations, um, they, they you simply find out, do you like this more or less than that? Very <coughs> much more, very much less. And you use about five or six points on a scale. And it can be jokes. It can be house paint. It can be airplane noise. It can be anything. But they get a, a scale which they can computerize very quickly. And uh, you'll find out all about it in Osgood, the semantic differential, or but also in Berlin, D.E. Berlin, Aesthetics and Psychobiology, mm -hmm. which is a much more sophisticated thing than Osgood. <coughs> but Berlin is here at the U of T, and he is attempting to measure all sorts of aesthetic experience, including humor, painting, responses to painting, music, so, and uh, he's studying uh, aesthetics and psychobiology. What's the visual environment? This is a good urban thing. society. <coughs> the visual All environment of urban. Visual environment of the city. Oh, he he works on the architecture too. Oh yes. This is a good place to introduce Alan Bernholtz's uh, theme yes. of today because Alan uh, was in here this afternoon and had uh, lunch with Marshall and I had a chance to talk to him for a, a half an hour afterwards. And Alan, uh, D.E. Berlin was the name, but Alan Bernholtz, coincidentally, an old member of the center here years ago, not many years ago, 1965, 6, 7, 8, has been at Harvard for years uh, in uh, architecture doing computerized approaches to architectural design and city design. And that that's what you were yes, looking uh, at. The, I think the uh, important thing in his work is that he has uh, produced land use diagrams, which are the big problem today in city design, to know how you're going to use land for different purposes. And you use this scale, you could call it the semantic differential, if you will, to say, how important you consider the different restrictions on the location of different facilities, like churches, schools, he libraries. He has 45 factories. different land uses in one yes. square mile, 45 right. different kinds of land use in so one square mile. you just take these, and then you ask yourselves a few questions of how important you consider the separations between these things. In other words, what restraints do you want to put on this situation? And you can put the replies in iconic form, that is, in logos that you can tell the computer that the church is represented by this logo and the factory by this one, the mine by this one, the golf course by another one, and so on. And you can get an instant reply in visual, uh, logo, and pattern form city structure to any question that you can uh, structure in this 
Or if using oh. using the various data you have about the land available and about the uses you intend to make of it, using that data you can feed it in and in 60 seconds or 90 seconds have a completely worked out answer for what would be the maximal use of those spaces for all of these purposes. Okay, the optimum use for the given situation. And this is, of course, when you're in discussion. Well, the point is, uh, Barry, about this instant yeah. uh, image of the uses that would, could be made. You People can say, uh-uh, I don't like it that way. Then you can vary the inputs and say, oh, that's better, oh, that's better, that's better. This it's like changing a shade of a color. In other words, this is a way to use the computer, not for for planning, but for probing. You notice that in the past, they've always said it's a computer program. Once you've got the answer, you've got to use it. Now, this way it says, no, no. Once you've got the presentation, that's where you start testing and saying, no, I don't like this. So the human being comes in right away and says, what will happen if we change so and so and such and such? Now, you could, you see, program it this way, say that we're not going to have any space in here that isn't entirely human scale. Everything could be pedestrian space. Every space in this city will be no motor cars needed. Every space can be accessible on foot. I was, I was interested when you said uh, just like uh, shades of color. Yeah. I know somebody, uh, Henry Evering of Eidetics, who works with color very uh, exactly the way you're saying that he works with color and personality and can build up a corporation on color matching mm -hmm. and the shades. So I thought that was a... Well, he lays out a city with a combination of color and logos. The color shows that the classification of land use, the logo shows the particular object. Well, it could, be a, play, it could be a golf course, a factory, a church. The logo is an iconic uh, structure in which people can find satisfactions. Uh, it's not just a, an enclosed space. It's a use and a kind of involved area, an area where you're deeply involved. They immediately perceive what the plan does to them. So you can pull out any one of these factors and say, now, what, would the, what would sort of a city would you have if you pulled out this whole factor? Would your whole in level improve in this, in this or that respect? On a human scale, no, because you're making the judgment. So this is a way to use a computer for probing, as we keep saying, rather than programming. And it's for dialogue. For dialogue. You can talk right back to, your own, to yourself. You can uh, hypothesize one pattern after another and simply have it feed back to you exactly what's in it. What are the consequences of doing Now, you could do the same thing for media. You could use, you could, uh, he's never tried this uh, on uh, himself, but you could program an entire community in terms of levels of or use of radio, TV, other media, book, and other intercom and so on. And you could find out just at what point of saturation you would get certain optimal effects <coughs> in the sensory life. You could, if you understood the effect of these various media on the human sensorium, you could then use the inputs to measure at what point the sensorium would benefit in this way or that way. So you could see that if you push the visual level up, up, up to a certain point, then you would see how the deprivation of other senses in the whole human community would take place. And you could say, no, that's, that's going to be too poor a mix for hearing and for touch and smell and so on, <coughs> and, and kinetic involvement through walking and so on. That is too poor a mix. So you could at once alter the mix of the components using your knowledge of media and the human senses. So it is a, it is a kind of completely unused approach to the computer. Now, ordinarily, the computer is used in what are called systems development, in which you take the components in a situation and you reduce everything in that situation to one common denominator of component. So that if you were dealing, for example, with a ground in a city that was made of, well, a multiple a great diversity of people and jobs. In order to deal with it in systems development, you'd have to reduce all the jobs and all the people to one common denominator of numbers. So many people per square foot, or so many people uh, in such and such space. And then this is the only way that systems development can cope, is it not, Barry? Well, 
this is the way it has gone, yeah. in that they always reduce uh, your inputs and outputs to common denominators which you relate with each other. It has to be the same stuff that you're dealing with, right. the same parameter, the same sort of, uh, there's no qualitative change permitted within the black box. <coughs> well, a person, uh, people are not allowed to be people in no. this, in a systems development setup. You say, I they are things, say. they are units, eh? Yeah, well, a pe person, a people is a boxes. unit. That's what bothered me about uh, Henry's system, though, the, the non-human... Who system? Uh, Henry Evering, who's doing... Well, I wasn't here, yeah. I wasn't here. Yeah, he's... Well, the systems are always quantitatively... The output is always quantitatively related to the input, and what your cybernetics do is simply stabilize it at some level or another. Yeah. That is, you decide what level you're going to stabilize this system at, but it's always a common denominator that you're dealing with for input and output. This allows you to enter the human being to transform the situation, you see. The interface between the outcome of, of the output of the computer is immediately transformed by your judgment of the situation. Well, whereas in the past, this hasn't been done. That's in the If you can optimize something by a computer model, either you develop some um, objective function that quantitatively yeah. states what this, um, what this overall function is that you want to improve, then you can, um, then you can through, through well, for example, you can, through, through a heuristic system. You can select so one right. item, pedestrian access. Do you mind opening those windows behind you there? It's, well, it's warm outside tonight. We don't have to have them closed. Uh, and we can have those open too, uh, uh, George. Uh, let's, uh, let's swing those open in there. You, uh, if you wanted to optimize the possibilities of pedestrian access to all services in a square mile area, this you could do quite easily on this particular computer model. But, but that, that would just optimize one function. Just one function. If you want, if you want to produce some overall optimization, whatever this criterion might be, yeah. you have to wait. Um, well, the, 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 um, the pedestrian function is weighted in such and such a way. The, uh, the aesthetic appeal Thanks, could be weighted in such and such a way. Yeah. And then you can do some overall function, right. which you can then optimize. But you can well, change the weighting of this thing rather yes, than you, uh, this you is can, the point. You, you can, can change um, your weighting and say, no, I don't like the outcome of this weighting, let's change it. Sure. In other words, you enter in as a human being to make a qualitative transformation of the rules of the game, if you like, so that it's replayed with other rules. Mm -hmm. Now, normally, you don't do this with yeah. computers. The whole system is set up in a mathematical formula, formula isn't it? Right? Sure. The whole system is mathematical. You simply change the formula. Back wow. to square one, and let's do it now. I don't know, think right. Berlin is working on systems development, though, is he? He no. says, you say, no. he's working on dialogue and, and feedback. They're not trying to find the ideal system. Dealing with semantic differentials established by people in their psychic judgment of situations, any situation, and trying to put it into, uh, trying to represent this in quantitative form without imposing the quantitative form on the situation. You could find out at what level of noise or interference visual values disappeared. Now, we're, that is, in, a, in a, any society of our Western world, what we call law and order is mainly visual. And uh, that means things keeping pretty well in line and well, contained the within bounds. But the old logic and the old assumption. The word violence, by the way, means just transgressing, going across boundaries, and it's a visual a sort of idea. So, you could find out now with a certain amount of noise or sound effect, at what point would all visual values crumple? At what point would the acoustic, in other words, could acoustic, this is for you in the air, air, uh, air noise, at what point can acoustic uh, values wipe out visual order and visual meaning in life? At a certain amount of roar, whether it's a rock band or an airplane, the visual world dissolves. All the parameters and, and order of a visual world disappear. At a certain amount of speed, all visual values dissolve. They just become a whir, a blur. And so in the electric world that we live in, the visual values are at a minimum. They're hardly here at all. And the children of our world are growing up with in environments that have very little visual character, in which the dominant values are acoustic and tactile and deeply involving and gutsy, but where the visual man, with his detachment, 
his idea of order as connected <coughs> rational space where that thing is obsolete. Now you could ask, you could in the by computer, you could find out how much will this situation stand in terms of noise or in terms of non-visual values before the visual thing collapses. Well, we happen to have passed that point. So it's, it is in our interest to discover how much must we dim down the non-visual, acoustic, and other involving tactilities of our world. How much must we dim it down before in order to retain any form of civilized or visual value. You could find this out on a computer. What sort of arrangements would you have to make in a city to retain visual space and visual values? I would say it's not the, it's not the level of the sound, it's the quality of the sound, the associations with the sound rather than the sound itself. That could be. Um, there are many kinds of sound. Certain kinds of music, for instance, yeah. would enhance uh, visual? a visual effect. Yes, and I'll tell you what kind. It has to have a tune. Clearly, clearly, uh, uh, there sound, has to be a tune now. The soundtrack of the movie. There is no tune, you see, in music. If it were, <coughs> it would not be music. Music is pure acoustic space, just environmental slop around you. Just slop. Just like the orchestra used to be in the 1920s in a hotel, you couldn't listen to it as music. It was there just so that you could eat your meal without being stirred by conversation. Or music. It's a form of programming, it's not music. And that's what Muzak said, we do not play music, we play programming. Meaning we make environments, we do not play music. And making environments is one of the things that uh, we're up, we're, we're all engaged in doing nowadays with new technologies. So now light, I propose Mr. Kelman here, what do we do about lighting as environment? Well, what city wise. Is, what is happening is something like uh, uncontrolled sound. It's uncontrolled light, high, high intensity, unbalanced color rendering, etc. And this is highway the, lights. Yeah, and and even pedestrian in some areas. And it it you know, it also destroys the sound because if you're walking down a street and you've got so you're hijacked down. by the light. Okay, and it's a light hijack. Um, and this is why I'm very worried because you mentioned creating the environment. Well, the engineer doesn't seem to be creating an environment. He's just simply creating a high light level. And uh, it's destroying the sensitivity. And all the other, at the same time, all the other factors, sound and smell, he's aren't being creating efficiency in the mm -hmm. he, He's creating an environment by, by destroying the other environment. Mm -hmm. you know, destroying mm -hmm. one and uh, automatically creates a or not. Well, now, for example, the sort of the sort of order created the, the sort of order created by a community of people who are acquainted with each other is very different from the order created by policemen amongst a bunch of strangers. That that's a very good point in relation to new lighting too, because uh, it's be you mentioned law uh, and order a few minutes ago, and all of a sudden I thought, what about the white light protective um, paternalistic? I almost get, you see, it's funny how a lighting engineer says he's not subjective and he doesn't relate to feelings like Victorian or, you know, mellow light. And at the same time, he is always moralizing when he puts lighting in to the point of just being obscene. And I try to communicate this to a lighting engineer that he's moralizing so much. Do you remember the phrase uh, in, in Moral and Juliet, how far yon candle throws its little beam, so shines a good deed in a naughty world? <laughs> the, but the, uh, to see a single candle out in the night is a very symbolic thing. Mm -hmm. uh, symbol, remember, symbol simply means pulling the rug out from under anything. The pen is mightier than the sword, means you deprive the pen of its public, its paper, everything. You just leave the pen out in isolation, naked. Symbol. Mm -hmm. But if you leave the pen there for a while, it ceases to be a symbol, it just becomes a dead thing. But what makes the pen a symbol is yanking the ground out from under it. You say it's mightier than the sword. But it's only while you yank the ground out from under pen that it becomes symbol. It's a ripoff. Yeah. Symbolism is a ripoff. And it means the process of stripping ground off figure. But 
this happens all the time under uh, media conditions. Almost anything can be ripped off and left standing by itself as figure, symbol. Do you notice what we're seeing here is that in the city, which puts the high intensity light, the ground takes over. It's no longer a symbol. It is an environment which swamps you, yeah, drowns you. I, just as you were saying that, I realized yeah. that, that the <coughs> instant, it almost relates to crime, too, because when they put the lighting levels up, it is a symbol for a moment. And then a year later, the crime level is higher, possibly. And it has changed its relevance in relation. Have you heard about the kinds of lighting that they're doing? I don't know where else they've done it, but I've seen it in Washington, D.C., where it's extremely high intensity lighting that prevents sha any kinds of shadows or anything. So and, it's, and it's in mm -hmm. high crime. Just yeah. It's really um, a joke. Because do, you, do, because do the crime levels go back up? Well, well they, no, they move to another part of town. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what happens is they put the lighting levels up, destroy contrast, and then you can't see anymore. Because seeing really is... There's no shade. You mean there's no shadow? No, there's no shadow. No, there's no shade. No, no sh it's like walking into a shop for a drug mart. And by the way, that's the high deal, that's the high deal, the ideal engineer's light. There's no shadow. Yeah. yeah. That is the ideal of the engineer. Yeah. That no means shadow. the tree doesn't exist. Well, what does that do to the environment? The perception of the environment. He hasn't studied environment. that. He said, that is the way I can see to make a machine piece <coughs> on a lathe or on a machine where an operator is working, and that's the idea of light, so that the operator can see what he is doing. So he's looking up at that, and he can see it. What kind of space does that produce with no shadow? Mm -hmm. well, I thought it is iconic. It, it tends to be iconic. It's, it's tactile. It's tactile space, not visual. And you notice it's used for operators who are working with metal and working with parts. I, I must have to your just your lumping all engineers as being complete Philistines <laughs> and never <laughs> any <laughs> aesthetic appreciation at all. <laughs> that's the old engineer. Uh, I, th okay, that's, that's a fair enough thing, but unfortunately it seems like uh, uh, there's a lot of the lighting engineers I've met throughout Canada have somehow managed to fall into that. I'm Maybe I'm just w running into the wrong people, I don't know. But this is, I've seen enough <coughs> cities now that have been ruined. But when you say lighting engineer, again, there's a need for figure ground. So a lighting engineer should be aware of other values besides lighting. Right? Yeah, that's, do uh, you know about board, the boardwalk in Toronto? They took these beautiful old beer mug lamps out and put in a really cheap, you know, you've probably heard about that cheap white light. And I was talking at Tr Toronto Hydro, and he said, well, no, we don't talk to the people. And he never really thought about the character of the ground. You know, we just simply put them in because Remember the old phrase, the Great White Way, Broadway, the Great White Way? Uh -huh. yeah. This is wh where uh, the incandescent lighting yeah. was, uh, on a large scale, was new. Mm -hmm. The Great mm -hmm. White Way, which meant, I suppose, White. just uh, well, an area like where everybody was an icon. Sure. And uh, you were not people. Light and shade necessary for the personal quality. And color, if you want to yeah. break that up because yeah. that's something about incandescent that's very good color. But with the new light sources, color is, is either monochromatic or virtually non-existent. You see, this is why we use this incandescent thing. We've discovered that those fluorescents are very unsatisfactory for a group just talking together. It destroys conversation. I heaven <coughs> knows what it does in offices and so on by the day. I think it, I just think it destroys uh, the dream world. It's light affecting the altered space of consciousness. I, my experience is that to move into a dream world would mean a certain light would have, or a non-lack of light would have to exist. And when I walked into Mercury, my, my mind would change. By the way, speaking of dream world, you know, if you push everything up into consciousness, out of the subconscious, you have a very peculiar state. I'm not sure how feasible it is, but You see, in a native society, which is preliterate and which lives very much by ASP and touch, <coughs> resonance, and so on, there really is no subconscious. Their entire wake -a day life is corporate and conscious. I mean, their entire rather dream life is corporate and conscious. <coughs> They're called the people of the dream, and they live a waking dream with very little private identity or existence. I think this is what happens on the inner trip, apropos, say, TV, 
the TV generation is moving into this world where there is no unconscious and where the consciousness tends to be corporate rather than private and where the whole gap between waking and sleeping is gone. And by the way, that's the gap of discovery. The <laughs> borderland between the two can be an area of discovery. That's called, there's a book on this by Hans Selye called From Dream to Discovery, in which he says that all the, uh, the big discoveries take place either when you're just going to sleep at night or while just waking up in the morning, and but fixed uh, on that borderland between the two, you'll make your discoveries, provided you have problems. You have to have problems that you have on your mind, and they will tend to solve themselves at those moments of going to sleep or waking up. <laughs> but you have to have a problem that on the back burner, put it on the back burner, not up front, <coughs> and let it simmer back there and, and it will... So do you think um, acoustic societies will now become very creative since we've given them so many problems to solve? Acoustic or non-literate, semi-literate? The they gap. are, you see, by definition, all children are creative up until a certain age of wakefulness. All children are extremely creative until the visual sense overwhelms the other senses. It could be that for a period of time, backward countries, as they move up into high-definition visual life, could be areas of tremendous discovery and creativity. In that, I noted in the Scientific American, if I read, read the article on uh, numbers this month, March, that children have great ability at counting, if you like, and can be learn, can learn to count, but not so much at ordering, that is matching. And all of the old mathematics was based upon learning the ordination, as they call it first, that is counting, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. The new maths are all based on matching, and they're now discovering that people can learn the new math of matching and have no ability whatever in counting. So that the assumption that the Russell and Whitehead in writing the Principia Mathematics that you start with the logical structure of the number system in order to be able to learn mathematics young is now proving to be the opposite yeah. because of their hidden assumption oh, well, having the opposite effect. We're getting it. That's a very, very abstruse area, Barry. They find that the whole new math. This is a bit abstruse. Is falling well for a group like this. Ordination. Well, all right. Order. Counting one, two, three, and matching. Oh no, it's just necessary, but it is a bit, I'd say, specialized at this moment. Well, it's in this very matter of space that we're talking about. Yep. The ordinal tactile is what comes to the child first, which is counting by the fingers. One of the books on our reading list is Danzig, Number: The Language of Science. And it's a fascinating history of number in various cultures. And the whole theory of numbers is based upon matching in the 19th century. And this is what the new math is based on. And it's breaking down for that reason. The, the visual assumption of the teacher compared to the all tactile experience of the pre Well, after country. all, counting toes and fingers. Uh, this is uh, not... Uh, this is not abstract, this is very sure. odd I'll take time. Yeah. Isn't that similar to the uh, natives where if they, they had seven objects and you took away one and it became even, they would know it. Mm -hmm. If you took away two and, they be, and it became five, they wouldn't be aware. Because they're not matching. Well, I think it's probably Good time. Is it about nine o'clock now, Mr. Richards? No, it's about quarter to two. Quarter to two. We can go for a few more minutes, and we'll take a break. Uh, if I may, then. Um, no. You made statements that uh, at a particular noise level, the visual oh, yes. world disappears. Oh, yes. And uh, when you said that, I mean, I know I'm passing back, but in a sense, uh, I think I'm supporting our, our aircraft mm -hmm. uh, uh, track over here. Uh, Immediately to my mind, there came a circumstance which I remember very clearly. Uh, I had an engine room in a shed, which had, which was only about uh, a half the size of this, and inside that space were four 2,000 horsepower B12 internal combustion engines supercharged. <coughs> and uh, one of these motors started up and idled the speed was plenty sufficient noise to drive an ordinary person straight out of the engine. With all four of them running and running at uh, 2,500 revs, 
the noise level, we have measured at 120 dB on the A scale, which is uh, well beyond the threshold of pain. And yet, and this is the curious thing where you say, okay, the visual thing disappears altogether. The men who lived in that engine room, the uh, uh, stokers and mechanics and people like that, they polished up the brassware, they all the exhaust manifolds, which made copper with the steel face in them. They made Turks heads. You know what Turks heads? Mm -hmm. A little wet winding of, of white cord which goes around uprights and things like that, and then they pipe plate them. They they made uh, a visual environment in there which they were tremendously keen on. By the way, this is sculptural, iconic. This is not visual. Okay. Now, I think this is where we come back to this guy over here. These people could only communicate with each other with scratch pads. Speech was totally impossible. Mm -hmm. um, but, in a sense, the thing that they were in, that environment of noise, was not in fact noise for them. Yeah. They, they were listening for and could pick out uh, one cylinder, one pot, which was missing out, out of that bunch. And they yeah. loved that noise. They, they, they could feel the whole thing, know, even though to us it was, it was just nothing at all. Do you know that you're talking about a symphony orchestra? Because I, I've spoken to players in these orchestras, big orchestras, they say, when you're a cellist in an orchestra or an instrument in an orchestra, he cannot hear one thing except noise, roar around him. He cannot hear anything that is being played. And the, these, they, they are live in the midst of noise, but they certainly are tuned, you see, through their uh, vibrations mm -hmm. to keep in relation to that mm -hmm. symphony. But they do not hear what is being played. So it's like saying you couldn't talk mm -hmm. in the midst of that uproar. Mm -hmm. But you could do all sorts of iconic signs. Mm -hmm. This is like the deaf, you know, who <coughs> talked with icons right. and uh, scratch pads, they too. Mm -hmm. They said, we had a group of deaf people here a few weeks ago who who's explained that uh, their speech was very much like Chinese writing. But the images they used to talk <coughs> by, by their hands and so on is very much like the ideograms, which are also auto tactile forms, not visual. Very few people seem to realize that the, the visual form is not wh where you have bounding lines around numbers or around copper exhaust or whatnot, that these are not visual forms, these are very tactile. Mm -hmm. Wherever there's a bounding line, you are really, t your eyes are touching that thing mm -hmm. and uh, you're going around it, feeling it. Uh, as a corollary of, of this, <coughs> it's not the level of sound, but the, uh, but the association in their case, uh, <coughs> an engine that was running well just sounded good because yes. they knew it they was running well. well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the little sounds where an engine was misfiring, that was what sounded bad. That's what they didn't like to hear. Mm -hmm. um, in, in studies made of, of aircraft noise, it wasn't the level of the noise itself that disturbed people. <coughs> it was, in fact, the fear of aircraft crashing on their homes. That, that people really objected to. Mm -hmm. And even if the aircraft was, were, were quiet, they would, they would subjectively dislike the sound mm -hmm. because of the associated fear of the aircraft passing overhead and, and crashing on their homes. Even just gliding down, idling, this could be very fierce. You know. uh, I'd like to say that, that uh, high sound alters and improves perception. <laughs> I used to yeah. go to drag races with 1,500 horsepower fuel injected and the engines going. The sound was so crucial that you felt airwaves hitting you. And uh, at Mission in Vancouver, I used to, as two dragsters went past and did 240 in five seconds, the sensory stimulation alter altered my sense of seeing and I started to get intense images of the on the mm. trees in the valley and everything. Well, they're not necessarily visual, but they are very visible. <coughs> but that is, you know, you pick them up by vibration rather than by simple photograph or snapshot, you see. The, um, the, ca the difference at the point at which a picture becomes tactile, and uh, you know, you, you've seen Steichen's photography, he zeroes in on objects until you get the texture rather than the appearance. Until the whole thing dissolves into just touch. 
the, the surface of a board or the surface of cloth becomes tactile and not visual. Now this is, most hi-fi photography today is not visual at all. It's very iconic and tactile, which involves all the senses. By the way, the iconic pulls in uh, the, uh, all of the sensorium. <coughs> now at very high speeds, uh, they, uh, they've discovered in training uh, people in the Second War for pattern recognition of enemy aircraft and so on, they discovered that sound was very helpful to, uh, to improve the visual power if they stepped up sound levels. Yeah, yeah they discovered that. And now if you mm -hmm. step up a wide screen, as you see in the tennis field down <coughs> at Ontario Place, <coughs> it's not a visual experience anymore, it's also Guts kinetic. Guts and you're yeah. just... And and there are some work with uh, an iMovement recorder that was developed by Dr. E. Llewellyn Thomas at U of T. We've been working with uh, Dr. Bruce Marshall of Miami University with this eye movement thing, which tells the, the activity of the eye, and we're trying to get activity of the eye, what the eye is looking at, back into what it's going in the brain. And maybe this is a parallel to what you're talking about, Ralph. And you. The greater the the visual activity on the scene, the more things there are to look at, the more input there is to the brain, is what we're tending to find. It's very hard to quantify again, but if there's just one billboard, and I mean billboard, if there's just one billboard out there, there's a less chance of, of retaining it and remembering it than if there's five or ten. And that's just an example in my area. Maybe you can translate that for me and what it means in terms of space. And there, are all sorts, there are all sorts of hidden factors in any of these situations, and when you mentioned billboards, you were already talking about this peculiar <coughs> antipathy that Amer North Americans have for anything outside. Any out-of-door advertisement has already got two strikes against it because it's polluting a space that the American regards as private. It shouldn't be there. Europeans don't have this feeling, but we do. You try to put an advertisement in a movie and you quickly get a, a response of hostility. The North American does not like billboards out on his highway because that's where he goes to be alone in his car. The advertisers don't know this, apparently. They're really wasting a lot of money antagonizing people. But... Uh, I may correct one thing. Uh, we don't have any billboards on highways. They're all in cities. I don't know whether that helps any. No, Well, no, it, it explains that they've discovered that it doesn't pay to put them on the highway. You see, we go out on our highways to be alone. That's in Canada we don't. In the, in the States they have them. They've had them on the highways, but I bet they found discovered, too, it doesn't pay. It's People not, it's resent... It doesn't pay. It was, it was a law passed about a year ago that, that, that there mustn't be any billboards <coughs> within um, 500 feet of, of federally supported highways in the U.S. That, that is recent, yes. That's a year ago. So um, this is this is not that it doesn't pay. It's just been been outlawed by the federal government. Mm -hmm. Well, there's also groups of people in the states, for example, going around <laughs> knocking <laughs> billboards down. down. Yeah. So it doesn't pay in that sense because people are chopping them down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, uh, mm -hmm. Isn't the fact that an antagonist you make you aware of it? Yeah, the yeah. There's a there is a theory, you know, a pain theory of getting attention at any cost, <laughs> <laughs> even if it, it kills them. <laughs> but <laughs> it, most advertising seems to be built on this pain theory. <laughs> yes, it's Ogilvy's book, uh, Frequency Expression of uh, Billboard Stars. He says, "Well, I do how I hit them, you know." Uh, Dr. Dr. Victor, uh, also he does get attention. Also says, "Doesn't matter what they say, but you find they remember." Yeah, that's uh, well, that's familiar. And uh, I certainly haven't suffered from that long. There's a drive-in theater in you know, Liverpool Road uh, out the other side. I think it's about uh, three-quarters of a mile back from the highway. And as soon as they put up the structure of the sign, they can see that they can see at a certain angle a little bit of the screen. And I think within about 24 hours, they had about 50 calls from drivers. You know, So they ended up by having to... Uh, spend about two hundred thousand dollars and rotate this thing in the whole bowl for five degrees. Mm -hmm. By the way, the coming back to that pain thing, you're on a very important factor. Humor is all based on pain, and the funny man is a man who inflicts pain in order to put you on. And all jokes are pain, painful experiences. Little boy in church turns to his mom and says, "He's talking, he's a preacher." Talking about daddy. 
<laughs> or two old gals sitting in church and the preacher's up there. He can't be talking about us, can he? He doesn't even know us. <laughs> but uh, now all jokes are put on. And uh, they, uh, do you name one? Uh, the, the guy goes inside the antique store and says, what's new? <laughs> now, he's, he's simply saying, you know as well as I do, that all, most antiques are fakes. Therefore, most of them are new. Um, however, the joke is a, a sudden uh, interface between two worlds. If a man does a pratfall, he, he deserts one world in favor of another world. As he flails through the air, he moves into the world of New Newtonian mechanics, leaving the other uh, pedestrian world in favor of this ast astro astronomical world of uh, Newtonian mechanics as he flies through the air with the greatest of ease. Now, between those two worlds, you roar with laughter. You cannot help but laugh when you see the man who suddenly leave one world and plunge into another world. If the guy comes tumbling <coughs> right over heels downstairs, you will laugh your head off at the same time that you panic and pick him up, hoping he hasn't broken his neck. But the laughter comes from this sudden interface between these two systems. Now, in terms of uh, the pain and adver advertising, uh, there is that principle of putting people on in the sense of grabbing their attention at any cost uh, by a rip-off. You put them on by bringing them out of one world into another world very violently. And this, of course, in that TV, they've discovered to their amazement that most people welcome a break because TV is very soporific. And the ad break helps them to wake up again and relax in another way. So that regardless of the uh, advertisement, they, there's a kind of respite and welcome in the break itself, which is an interval of interface. But advertising is based to a large degree on pain. <coughs> Redundancy, repetition, and penetrating and drilling right through a person. Jokes, likewise, though, are based on pain. Uh, but if you spread it wide enough and hit enough people simultaneously, they will consider you a very fine man. I was another point about this embarrassment. Um, one, if, if someone slips on a banana and falls over, that's funny because you laugh because you don't really know what to do. You don't know whether to, to rush and help him or whether, <coughs> yes, you, you're whether you should ignore him. You're between worlds. There are two and, worlds. Uh, one of security and one of violence. There are two worlds. And they're rubbing together like mad. That's when you love. But if, 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 if you if By the way, it's inflicted on yourself... What do you, have you noticed what laughter is? It's a violent attack of nervous energy attacking the muscles of the face? Sure. Why this sudden outburst of nervous energy? It's because your adrenaline rises when, when you feel you should do something, but... Know what to do. Well, anyway, it's a very mysterious emotion. The laughter is a metaphysical emotion of very mysterious kind. It's a special kind of emotion. <coughs> very little is known about laughter. And very little is known about how we put people on. It's called charismatic. When you are wearing the image of about 20 people, you're charismatic. When you're just being private, you're nobody. Anybody who just like Nixon, his problem is he just stands up there and he's only Nixon. He should have been able to put on hundreds of people by now and be charismatic. He doesn't know how to put them on. What, what is known about the difference between animals and humans? In regard to what? <laughs> well, that's uh, that's not my subject. I'm not I'm not interested in animal laughter. We've got a cat around there who sneers at us, but I <laughs> 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 so or sometimes hisses at us. <laughs> Cat or cat, yes. Or speech sometimes. Oh, yes. However, the people, too, are sometimes divided by their, uh, between those who can and those who can't laugh. There's a great big gap between people. But this, uh, the fact of laughter as a as watershed between worlds and a kind of, well, it's all right, you might say it's a dividing line between the uh, sleeping and the awake. The subliminal person, the person who lives in the underworld, isn't going to laugh, isn't going to laugh at anything. I don't think people in the, an inner trip are likely to laugh very hard at anybody. The, uh, is that true? Uh, mad people aren't supposed to laugh very much. They're too consistent, too logical. I, I don't know if that's true. I don't know either. <laughs> Why don't we find out? 
I think um, people in, in acoustic oral cultures laugh a lot. And those but not for the same motives. I mean, when they're laughing, it's not funny, is it? It's, there, it's not funny when the Japanese laughs. <laughs> it means that you've just yeah, about had it. The end of your hour. That's the end of you. <laughs> about the time he begins to laugh, you, you've had it. <laughs> as you're beheaded. We think of laughter as good humor. Very few people do. Very few people, only wasps, think of laughter as good humor. <laughs> the non-wasp world does not regard laughter as humor. It's triumph. It's a kind of glorying over the victim. I think the American Indian would be an exception to that. I don't know. How does he go? I, I find very close to... Uh, does he laugh? Lay, laugh his head off? A lot more than we do. A lot more... Yeah, I know, but he's, he's, he, you think of him as a good humor character? You haven't read very much. <laughs> Not as a good humor character, but in, in terms of the difficulties they face. Oh, maintaining well... Maintaining humor as a defense... All right. Of you think of humor? Energy. All right. Yes. You think of humor as grievance. It's a defense. It's a d against grievance. When you're full of rage, you usually develop some very good jokes. It's all sorts of funny things come to mind when you're angry. For some people. Yeah, for for the for for resourceful people. Mm -hmm. Of course, the mere victim types are, no, are not in a different category. There's uh, two, there's supposed to be two attitudes to life according to, I think, the Japanese, they use this division between the ah, uh, the ah-ness of existence and the ha-ha-ness of existence. Ha-ha! That's one attitude toward existence, and the other was ah. This is the sentimental, the aesthetic attitude, the ah-ness of life. And the other one is the aggressive and savage attitude, the ha-ha-ness. Ho oh, ho! <laughs> it's menacing, aggressive. Uh, but um, laughter can have many, many meanings and uh, mostly uh, unpleasant. It's only in very special company that laughter is considered gentle or urbane. I think the West Indians are a good example of uh, people who are good, very good humored and laugh. Even more than wasps. I think it's genuinely good humor. My experience. Well, no, it's nice to know about that. It's been my experience. Right, right now, the car was discussing the correlation between sense of humor and, and IQ. I was alleging that there was a correlation. Oh, really? Gee, I haven't thought about that. So, anybody got any thoughts about uh, the correlations, if any, between? IQ levels and laughter levels? Reverse no, not laughter, it's sense of humor. Sense of what well, humor is incredibly elusive. You know, all foreigners are funny. That's uh, For Englishmen, all foreigners are funny. Now, that's uh, considered a sense of humor in England. Any, any idiot who doesn't know how to behave the way they behave is funny, that's all. But I think that is a criterion of humor in any country. If you don't do it our way, you're funny. John Moss has got an interesting catch on the, on the humor, um, the sense of humor of the Goethe's. Who are they again? Uh, John Moss is about the Goethe's. But who are they? The Nepalese, uh -huh. people from Nepal, uh -huh. who were um, worked with the British Army. And the specific case that he gives is of uh, a well-liked um, soldier by his brother soldiers, who accidentally decapitated uh, in a border skirmish with uh, uh, Afghanistan tribes. And um, his, his fellow um, soldiers in the platoon were then discovered roaring with laughter and playing football with his head. <laughs> he was a good guy. I mean, he was a very nice fellow. And he died well. But obviously, I mean, there's some use for this. It's a round object and it rolls along like that. And it's a good game of football. Yeah, well, actually, but they're not. They're not. Apparently, yeah, foot um, uh, uh, football as a game is supposed to have originated th in that form that the kicking of a decapitated head through the compound was, <laughs> was and uh, under, uh, under, you know, rules of two teams, was the origin of football. But it had a ritual meaning. It wasn't just uh, spontaneous fun, you know. Well, I think we'll, we'll, we'll just take a, a little break there, and uh, we're going to have a bit of cider while it lasts, and uh, finish up the last of the cider.
Peyton makes him very much aware, doesn't he? He's remarkably aware. Yes. Uh, and I, I have, I've always had the feeling here that I've, I've, he's always puzzled me as a character, and I've, I've often felt, you know, why didn't Peyton make him a little less aware? Because he ta- when he talks about the church at the beginning of the book, he makes sense, and Samangu agrees with him. And, uh, uh, which may be rationalization on, on John Camillo's part, but whether it's rationalization or not, there's a heck of a lot of truth in it. And, uh, and I had this, I have this strange feeling that when we're on this business of awareness and fear, that, that the, uh, the awareness alone isn't going to get him anywhere, because he's more aware than Stephen Camillo would do something, even, even at the end of the novel. That's what I thought. John Camillo and Stephen Camillo.